Welcome back to the morning show here on the Rise News. I am Adesua Omoruan. And I'm Rufa Yoseni. When it comes to dislodging the excruciating poverty afflicting the Nigerian masses, the reason did a mountain to climb. Regardless of this, President Muhammad Buhari is hopeful of a better future for the downtrodden in the country. Uh, drawing inspiration from other countries that are overcoming similar odds, the president says the government can lift 100 million Nigerians out of poverty in 10 years. Our government elected by the people in 2015 and re-elected in March has been mapping our policies, measures, and laws to maintain our unity and at the same time lift the bulk of our people out of poverty and onto the road to prosperity. This task is by no means unattainable. China has done it. India has done it. Indonesia has done it. Nigeria can do it. <clears throat> With leadership and sense of purpose, we can lift 100 million Nigerians out of poverty in 10 years. Following the 60% drop in oil prices between 2015 and 2016, through monetary and fiscal measures, we stimulated economic growth, curbed inflation, and showed up our external results. We now have witnessed eight quarters of positive growth in the economy, and our GDP is expected to grow by 2.7% this year. Furthermore, our external reserves have risen to 45 billion United States dollars, enough to finance over nine months of current import commitments. This administration is laying the foundation and taking bold steps in transforming our country and liberating our people from the shackles of poverty. Mm. How feasible is this? Mm. 100 million Nigerians out of poverty in 10 years. Well, Ubong King, motivational speaker and entrepreneur, joins us now to discuss this and how Nigerians can empower themselves. Welcome to The Morning Show. Thank you very much. A privilege being Great here. To Great you. to be here, Ubong. Uh, how feasible is this? And I want you to start with a trajectory of your story because you were part of a hundred million people you came out of the depths the the runt of the litter if I to use Game of Thrones terms mm -hmm. <laughs> and you came out of the depth of poverty where you could barely aff afford meals to as eat. As a security guard. As a security yeah. guard. I mean, t tell us, walk us through that story. That story might just hit one Nigerian out there. Okay, um, first of all, thank you for being here. I don't take it for granted that um, we are in this set. Now, my story is a typical Nigerian story, um, and I'll start from the root cause. Because right growing up, we were told that the future has a lot for us, so we were looking forward to the future. And looking forward to the future, you do not know that there are certain things that must be in place for you to get to that future. At the age of 13, I lost my father, who died at the age of 39. So first of all, my future was altered, because there's a part a father has to play, and a part a mother has to play. If your parents don't do the fundamentals, know that you're first going off course. Now, my father was a mentor to me, because I saw him work and bring back results home. So when he died, there was nobody to play that role. Everybody in the family or friends that used to come to the house stopped coming. Now, back in school, I went to Federal Government College in Janiki, Lagos. I was not very good in English subjects. I'm a mathematician. I like the numbers. If you tell me multiply two times two, I'll tell you four. But if you say multiply two by two, there's a confusion there. So that affected me, and I was heckled a lot by my mom. So my mom and I were not very good friends. So that brought me in because she kept heckling me. And I, and I thought there was something I could do. But because she kept talking down on me, it made me, you know, lock myself in. So when I was graduate, when I was finishing secondary school, I didn't do well in English, but I did well in other mathematics. So it affected me going to school in uni 1989, Uniben. 
I was dropped because I didn't have English. 1990, last year I was dropped because I didn't have English. 1991, I was admitted into Unical to study agri-economics. But because of English, I had to defer from doing agri-economics to education agri. And my mom heard that I wanted to be a teacher and disowned me. So by 19, I was disowned. Mm. So to take care of myself was a bit challenging. I had to you know, leave Calabar and come and work in somebody's fashion shop in Onikewaya, and I'll stay there. And after three months, I'll go back to school. So that affected my grades. I came out of school with a third class, extra year, and I didn't go for NYC because I was already a failure. So everybody knew me as failure, and I accepted. So on my own mindset, I believed that failure was my portion. Mm. That, that was my portion. Now, coming out of that, I said, what can I contribute? I wanted to prove to myself that I was not a liability, so I decided to serve as a security guard out of a church for like three years. And I was not paid. So when somebody gives me 10 naira, 20 naira, once I have 30 naira, I will now go into where construction workers were eating. And you know, the food construction workers eat are different from the ones normal human beings they eat. So when you tell the woman three fingers, that means two wraps of gari, extra one without meat. Meat was luxury to me. I would either take extra ebad and extra meat. Because for me, if I needed something to chew like meat, I'll take unripe purpose to serve as vegetables, serve as fruit, and serve as meat. After all, it's meat that's eating, not, <laughs> not you. I served there, and I wanted to prove to myself that I was not a failure. My motivation to choosing that pattern of industry, that security, was because my father did not die properly. He was taken out by somebody close to the family. And I wanted to grow up to be a security man to also take a revenge. But unfortunately, by the time I grew, the man died, so I couldn't go back mm -hmm. on him. Then I started working. I started in that uh, church. I would read magazines on security day and night, day and night. I was squatting in somebody's house. But I said, no, something must change in my life. If we want to change Nigeria in 10 years, it must be a decision that the whole country must be a part of. It is not for one person to sit somewhere and think the whole country. For my system of education, it is failure in waiting. We need to change the way they are thinking. We need to change the syllables. We need to be progressive at this is our target, 100 million people in 10 years. Now look at the numbers very well. Every year, like this year, January 1st, we had 25,856 children that were born on January 1st in one day in Nigeria. 25,000. So by the end of the year, we'll have 9.3 million children added to our population. Last year, January 1st, 20,210 children were born in one day. So we had an ingress of 7.3. So in two years, by the end of this year, between 2018 and 2019, 16 million children would have been added to our population. So, so you had, just listen to that story, you had the zeal, you had the passion, and you had the drive, and you were determined to say, I have to be the difference, even though everybody has seen me as a failure. Mm. When you look at the Nigerian youth of today, do you see them hunger and thirst for their pa passion and that drive mm. to make the difference? In this day, one of the things that is there is that what they see, you see the eyes is a gate to the mind. Mm. And there are five gates. One is the eyes, which is sight, the nose, what you smell, the ear, what you listen to. And I tell people that, look, whatever you allow enter your ear, whatever you allow enter your eyes, affect your decisions. Particularly, those are the strongest decision makers now. So if a young boy who is 18, 19, 20, let's even start from 15, all he listens to are very vulgar, lewd uh, music every day of his life. There is no way he will turn out good. Mm. It has to be something that it has to be deliberately channeled that he begins to hear the right thing. And every young child, every young boy or girl, you know, is like soft cement we put in a mold. If you don't correct it then, when he becomes 25, 26, he has lost significant years of his life. And I tell people that if somebody is 20 years old and is still in his father's house, it's a shame. And I get heckled a lot. And I say, listen, in Nigeria or any other country, if you want to join these security services, you only need to be 17 years old. And you need a letter from your father. But if you are 18, you don't need any letter from your father. So if at the age of 18, the government can train you and trust you to defend the country, well, why can't you change your mindset to become successful? What we do is that we put our young boys and our young girls at home, and we feed them with breakfast, lunch, dinner. By 2 o'clock, the boy is looking for four wraps of pounded yam. And with um, all the meat, he will eat. 
by 4 o'clock he's watching football, Arsenal. He can tell you everything about West Ham, about Chelsea, about Arsenal. He knows who bought who, who bought. He knows everything about complete football, but does not know anything about his complete life. How do you want that person to become productive tomorrow? Are you not being too harsh on the Nigerian youth? Is the environment <laughs> there for them to thrive? You see, the, the, everybody, we did not select where we were born. Okay. Yes, but the, where we end up is our decision. I was born in this same country. I have a green passport. I'm not being hard on Nigerian youth, but I would not allow each, um, us as Nigerian youth keep, you know, transferring the responsibility to somebody else. If, those, if, if our leaders and our elders have failed to position us, we can't keep that because tomorrow we will be the leaders there. How do we, we owe our young ones that are coming to correct their normally, so we can't continue blaming the youth, I mean the older ones. Let's develop Nigeria, let's create opportunities. And you have some young Nigerians that are fantastic. Eh? Recently I heard that the highest paid robotic engineer in the whole world is a Nigerian boy, 26 year old. 26 years old. His product, which is the Mechamon, is sold exclusively by Apple. He's a young boy. Now, he has been talent spotted. He may not be in the country now, but he's a Nigerian. Now, if you tell that boy, say, look, how do we plan robotics transition in Nigeria and give him a platform? Yes. But not the one that you put a mechanic as minister of this. Uh, come on. Okay, let me take you on, on many issues. Uh, yeah. Wanga. The very first one is what worked for you? How did you do it? Because all of a sudden, you didn't just Hunger. make that, that Hunger. transition. Hunger. Yeah, but. but Ubang, there are a lot of Nigerian youth today what are you that eating? are hungry. What are you eating? That are hungry. Yes. But they will tell you, I'm just hungry. There is no platform to exhibit. Ubang, you had a platform to Which exhibit. Which platform? I did not have any platform. I created my own. How did you create your platform? I went to Osho the market. On the floor, I saw a magazine, 100 Naira, 1150, on a, on a subject. Whatever you eat, if you read magazines on security in the morning, eat it in the afternoon, eat it at night, if you read fashion, if you read whatever, whatever you spend your time on, whatever you eat, and continually eat, will eventually eat you up. I had security magazines morning, afternoon, and night. I would go to, um, uh, what do you call this place again, CMS, yeah. in front of that cathedral. Those boys that are selling magazines, I'll buy it. They even knew me. They would reserve for me because I was constant. Every week, I go there. So how did you start up your business? Because that's where a lot of Nigerian young people are, are faced with. They are today in their lives. They I started, want to start up their business. I started how, my how, business from my bedroom. How? From my bedroom. A table, my wife approved I could start from my bedroom. What if those that don't even have a bedroom? Well, you bedroom. have a bedroom, yeah? See, look, every time things get simpler. What, see, once ever you decide your target, your target determines your direction. Your direction will generate your association. Until you decide your target, you're not going anywhere. What do you want out of life? Just make it, forget the how. Just first of all, say that. You can write it on the wall. And what I did was that my target, I wrote it on my wall, wrote it on my ceiling, wrote it everywhere. It was encompassing around me. I didn't want to see anything. I don't listen to negative news. I don't want to. I only listen to news that will give me my direction, will focus me on where I want to go. And the more I kept doing that, I was not aware of the failure, of the wickedness, of the, of the, of the setbacks there. I didn't see all that. Because by the time I look straight now, everything became just a passing. Ob obstacles are constant in winning. So you started from the bedroom. Yes. Walk us through how you started, how you had your first contract, how you did this, how you did that. In practical terms, because okay, it's okay. motivational. Okay, yeah. no, okay. Let's do it like this. Remember I said I was a security guard, yeah. and I read magazines on security. In that security magazine I saw, it told me that, look, this is a material. Now, following the back edition was what I read. So I now said, okay, where is this place? It was at Mebutemeta. Uh, what did I do? I now took night bus from Akwaibom. I came to Lagos, and I didn't sit on a seat. I did attachment, the one you stand, not the one you sit down. I came to Lagos, went to Ebutemeta, and I went to the man's office, and I bought back editions. Okay, hold that thought. We'll, we'll go on a quick break. We'll come back. You, you stay told that story. Great to have you back on The Morning Show here on the Rise News. Ubo King, Ubong King, motivational speaker and entrepreneur, is still with us in the studio. Let's talk about your story yeah. and how you, know, you went from zero to where you are today. And I'd asked you earlier if you're not being harsh, too harsh in the Nigerian years. Are you saying you did all of this without finance? Because that is a major challenge. You look at our banks. Are they open to startups? How did you get here without finance? Did you get here without finance? I think you should pick up the story from where you said you came in the night bus. You were mm -hmm. talking about. Okay. Like you I said, to Lagos. I came in the night bus. I got to Lagos. And I went to this um, office. 
where they were producing the book, and I saw the man. And he said, you came to get back edition. He saw my passion, and he now said, give him 10 more editions. So I had 20. I wanted to read to improve myself. So because of what he saw, that my hunger was to improve myself, he gave me an opportunity after two months. He said I could come and work with him. So I left Uyo to come to Lagos to work with him. And when I came there, my first salary was 5,000 naira per hex security service at Ido. It wasn't in VI, Ido. So we'll pack the cow, enter bus, and cross with oil and everything. And from 5,000, my salary, this was in um, um, 2019, uh, I got mine in 2002 in 1989. Now, so I was there, and I worked there. While working there, he was the secretary of the Nigerians, um, uh, Nigerian Professional Security Association. So all the companies of security were all in the, in, in the association. And because I was serving as his PA, carrying the things about, so I got to meet people. When I started, I volunteered to be his PA in every other, I didn't, I, I walk at his back and call. If he goes on night patrol, I will follow him. I was not working for my convenience or for money. I was working for learning, to learn. So I volunteered those times because 5,000 would not take you anywhere. I could have just stayed at home, but because I wanted to prove to myself that I could make it, I could work, I could add value. So while doing it over time, I, I had another opportunity in a company called Alarm Center. And before I got to the alarm center, I was thinking, okay, let me go and start my own, because it was as if I was overdoing myself. So I went to start Guided, and it was a big flop. So alarm center gave me a platform, and I did not know alarm center was a central monitoring station. Pahek taught me passion. Alarm center taught me technology. That's when I saw the technology and security, that you can press a button and 10 minutes people are there responding. I said, oh, wow. So I was there. And I did not know that managing that kind of company was a higher responsibility from Pahek Security to Alarm Center, taught me technology, then from there I went to Halogen. Halogen taught me the business of security. As at the time I was in Halogen, my, off, my house was in Alagbado, I would take Okada from Alagbado to make sure I meet the briefing by 7.30. God help me if I'm not there. I will, so, I will go through sanctions. And because I w we're all under structure, if my immediate boss tells me I should go and do night patrol, I, don't, I won't tell him that because my contract is eight to five. No, because the SOP will tell you and any other thing as directed by your manager. Now, my salary was 140,000 naira. It had gotten to that level. Yes, I was happy that I thought I had made money. The more money you make, the more responsibilities come. At this point in time, people began to come into me. So I work. I have never really applied for a job. People just see that you are good, you can add value to them, so you move on. But start, nothing starts until you start. Then I joined a company called Excel Management Services. Excel there taught me corporate governance. So in Excel, you enter a board meeting, and then you know what it means to wear white shirt with a tie, but you can come out and get very angry. Because when you try to defend what you are doing, somebody will just break it down. So co co I learned corporate governance in Excel Management Services. And after that, I now thought, what is the next plan for me? I said, OK, it's either because my daughter, I had three children at this time. They didn't, I couldn't pay their school fees because the money I was earning was lower than school mm. fees that was coming. So if I needed to save their money, I needed to save money for three to four months. I have a wife and I have to, I, I'm taking a loan on a car to go and uh, do security, to buy uh, a, a car. I bought a car um, off a microfinance bank and I couldn't make my payments on time. So I was defaulting. And I say, if my children's school fees is this amount, like 400, because there were no public school were not working for me, private school, and then my salary was not going to cover that every time. So what did I do? And I said, look, I needed to start a business for myself. I made the mistake of saying, let me collocate with somebody. So collocating with the person, I had to pay 80,000 naira a month. To collocate with him, I had to drive my car to the office, which was 60,000 naira a month, 3,000 naira, 20 days in a month. I kept my, I, I'm very good with my numbers, so I'm able to project. Now, I decided that I was going to get <laughs> a secretary to work. Say, okay, I agree 40,000 naira, because I thought I needed a secretary. I did not need a secretary. I didn't even need to go and co-locate with anybody. So I had a bill of 185,000, and I didn't have any product. I didn't have any client. 
So I now said, okay, let me shut the office down, shut this, then go back home. Spoke to my wife. She gave me a table in the bedroom. So that table was in the bedroom. My laptop there, internet, IPNX was there. Connected it, and my target board that I wanted to do security at high level. And I said, look, I don't want to deal with small money. I wanted to do with money that was good. So I now wrote the figure that was my target. And when I wrote the figure that was my target, I said, in which sector of security can I get this? And it took me down to maritime. Maritime was paying better than the guard force services. I said, okay, what do I do? Go to LinkedIn. Go and join LinkedIn and find out the people in the maritime community. I started hearing things about the Gulf of Aden. I didn't know Gulf of Aden was uh, Somalia water, that there was a problem. Then they said the Gulf of Guinea. Gulf of Guinea was Nigerian water. So I now kept studying. So when they were talking about the maritime, I didn't understand. But I stayed there. I became a student under the people that were talking in the industry. I wanted to enter. Sometimes to study is not easy. But I stayed there tenaciously. And they asked about Port Harcourt, I'll answer. Ask about Lagos, I'll answer. Ask about Abuja, I'll answer. So I began to be a reference point for them. Then somebody there offered me an opportunity and said, King, there is something we want to do from Djibouti to Mombasa. Can you do it? I said, yes. Meanwhile, I didn't know where Djibouti was. I didn't know where Mombasa was. Because people think that Africa is just one country. So I now, on that LinkedIn, I got a friend, said, Guy, there is transaction in, in Kenya. Can you do it for me? He said, yes. I said, OK, no problem. And you have to pay me my broker's fee. He said, no problem. He charged them $150,000. And I said, OK. And within 48 hours, they transferred this money to him. He called me and said, King, send me your account number and I'll pay you the money, your 10% brokerage. I took my calculator, my phone, Nokia 3310, God bless that phone. <laughs> and I calculated $150,000 times 150. My phone told me error. That was the aha moment. That my phone couldn't calculate that money. That whatever happened, how much was my salary in a year? Something 3.6 million. In one day, I could make 2.25 million. We can sit all, down here all mm. day and talk about this story. Very insp inspirational. But from what you have said so far, people mm -hmm. gave you the opportunity. They gave you the chance to prove yourself. Are we giving the young people the chance to prove themselves? No, see, and then you, you, you found out from your personal research mm. that maritime was going to be the big deal for you. Mm -hmm. Just looking at the Nigerian society now mm. and the economy, what areas do we need to focus on? I know you don't want to talk about the government. You're saying the people need to do this, mm. these themselves because the government is failing. Mm. So what areas should the Nigerian youth be looking at to jumpstart the economy and improve themselves or empower themselves? Everybody is a talent. Everybody has something. Right now, digital economy is going wild. Somebody you have a good voice over. You can go every day and begin to start a podcast with your phone. And then start it and people can subscribe to it. You can go on YouTube and then teach people something. And people can become your fan. You can start an online course and you make money. The problem is that we don't want to be diligent to study what is the process. Now, you said people gave me opportunity. Nobody gave me. I found the opportunity where there is but no... But nobody was asking you for three years working experience or ten years working experience. No, I added value. Look for where you can add value. If you have a good voice over, tell look, I can read. You'll make mistake day one, day two. Look, the house where Mr. Success lives is on Failure Avenue. You yeah. are authorized to fail. If you are not failing, that means you are not trying. But if you are going to succeed, failure is... I fail every single day till now. It's part of my uniform. Failure is part of my uniform. So I don't give an excuse because I failed today or failed tomorrow. When I fail, I learn something from that failure. I pick something up and I keep running. Nobody gave me an opportunity. I found the opportunity and I moved towards it and I improved myself every single day. But, 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 but not everybody in this country will have the same drive like you have. And that's why when you look at the most developed nations in the world, they have something called a social safety net. Mm -hmm. But that is not even available in this country. And I'll give you an instance. The reason why we see Airbnb today mm. was because there was a social safety net that gave people credit card in America. And most of the first investment in Airbnb mm. was on the founder's credit card. Mm. But you don't even have something like that in Nigeria. That's the beauty. Are we being realistic? That's the beauty about Nigeria. That's the beauty. I will tell you, because we have too many problems, there are too many opportunities. We keep shouting problems up 
problems identify opportunities. Why are expatriates coming to this country? Because they see your problems. I'll give you a classic example. An Asian man comes into this country, he sees that you don't have light. He sees that you don't have money to buy a generator. He sees you don't have the, um, the money to even buy a pass my neighbor. So what does he do? He goes back with your problem. He creates rechargeable touch light. He creates a power bank. So you can charge the power bank and use it on your phone. That business of power bank is money for him. They don't have problem with power in their country. They see that this is it. It's a very simple thing. There's a report called the Global Competitive Index Report. For God's sake, pick it up and read. Because those, those, that problem is where you see opportunities and you read it. You have to study. Gold is not hidden on top. You have to search it and clean it out. And when you find it, you then become royalty. Thank you, Bunk. Thank you so much. I mean, I think it's just best to rest it there. That's a tonic for Friday. Uh, that's, uh, that's a tonic for Friday. Uh, we again, <laughs> we still have a bit of time. So let me just quickly ask you this. Mm. Are you absolving the government at all levels from empowering young Nigerians? Well, let me say this and say it clearly. It is one thing to be elected into an office. It is another thing to do the office. The people that have been elected to office, are they qualified to be in that office? In whichever, whether at local level or whatever level. Let's go to Singapore. Singapore made a decision that whoever is sitting on any seat must be the best. When you have the best in that field, you'll get the best result. If you don't have the best in that mm. field, you will be complacent with any results you have. I think that's a good Thank way so to leave it. That's it. Thank you so much, Mr. Yeah, Uber King. Back.